Welcome back to Omics Logic Transcriptomics, where we discuss next generation sequencing data analysis methods and application to a variety of different challenges in cancer, infectious diseases, and biotechnology. This program is organized around six major topics, the tools and resources for transcriptomic data analysis, processing next generation sequencing data, including pre-processing, mapping, and quantification, analysis, normalization, and visualization of gene and isoform expression, an introduction to big data mining, machine learning, and predictive data analysis, analysis of single-cell RNA-seq data, tissue-specific expression based on cell types, and introduction to hands-on project examples in a variety of different fields. The goal of this session is to give you an overview of ways you can open and explore data in R, Python, and Excel, how to define the headers and the numeric matrix that we will analyze, how to identify genes, samples, and groups, how to use visualization to summarize data, and how to understand data variability and general patterns that you should expect to find in the table of expression. Before we go on, let's briefly do a review of quantification of mature mRNAs, how to eliminate technical variation, how to find the best strategy to map your reads onto the reference genome, quantify genes and isoforms in your data, and prepare the table of expression. All of these are covered in detail in the online transcriptomics course that you can find on learnomicslogic.com. There you will have a detailed explanation of pre-processing steps, various strategies for mapping, and quantification of gene and isoform table of expression. You will also find detailed tutorials on how to perform differential gene expression analysis and annotate your genes, which is something that we will briefly touch on today in this session. So how is mRNA abundance measured in biological samples? One way that it is done is through reverse transcription PCR or RT-PCR, which amplifies DNA based on primer sequences that frame the section of interest. The other way is to look at northern blotting, where an RNA sample is digested into fragments that are separated by size in a gel using electrophoresis. And finally, microarrays, like northern blots, are hybridization-based methods that provides highly detailed information about the individual genes that have been transcribed by putting those into a chip. For next-generation sequencing data analysis, what we need to know is how data from the sequencer becomes digitized. So we talked a little bit about different formats like FASTQ, FASTA, and GTF, that are critical to understand for processing the data and turning it into a structured table of expression. The basic idea is to process short reads that need to be cleaned up from any technical variation mapped onto the reference genome or transcriptome and then quantified by counting the level of expression and assigning a number to each element that is placed into a table called the table of expression. We have already done a few exercises that you can perform on the tbioinfo platform, where color-coded buttons represent methods of analysis, starting from pre-processing, like Trimomatic and PCR Clean, onto different mapping strategies, like HiSat2, CuffLinks, CuffMerge, and Bowtie, and finally quantification with RSEM, HTSeq, or Sailfish. If you practice this several times, you will find that different combinations of methods will provide you with different pop-up screens where you can learn about inputs and outputs for each step and learn in detail about each method, finding publications where you can read and understand what goes into every single one of those buttons. One standard way that others have described this process is through a tuxedo protocol. The tuxedo protocol standardly involves such methods like top hat, which include bow tie and cuff links. The top hat protocol has been around for a number of years, since 2009, where the idea was to provide a comprehensive process from raw reads to expression levels, differential gene expression, and even plots where you can see differentially expressed genes. But since the time that top hat has been published in 2009, a variety of different methods for alignment, quantification, and other methods have been generated. And now we see that there is a focus on speed and accuracy 
that is represented by methods like Sailfish and Callisto, which are called alignment-free uh, strategies for quantification. These have been extensively benchmarked, and if you're interested in looking into the various methods that are available for mapping, quantification, and data processing, you should do a literature review and you will find a number of different papers that describe the differences, similarities in terms of speed, in terms of uh, the outputs and the inputs that these methods provide, and also how to use them based on your research question. But to summarize, all of these steps could be organized into these three distinct steps, pre-processing, mapping, and quantification. And we color code them so that it is easier to remember how these different algorithms, which are really many, are organized into logical steps for processing RNA-seq data. At the end of this process, you will get an expression table. And so the obvious question is, how is this table organized? What do these numbers represent? What can I do with these numbers so that I can find meaningful patterns? And so today we'll talk a little bit more about what a meaningful pattern is, how to look at global patterns and individual patterns, and what can we learn about the nature of RNA-seq data from analyzing and exploring the table. The table includes columns that are organized by sample name. So if you have samples from different categories, they could be grouped. And then you also have genes. And those genes are typically encoded in one way or the other. And we'll talk a little bit more about different formats that you might expect to find in your gene expression data. The level of expression varies by the type of normalization technique that is applied to derive an actual number. As you can imagine, reads don't stack up accurately for a whole gene, which could be fairly long, maybe thousands of nucleotides, as opposed to a read that could only be a hundred or a couple of hundred of nucleotides long. So how they stack up could vary significantly across the whole gene. And to produce this number, the strategies vary. So what we'll talk about in today's session has to do with the annotation, the numbers that we have in the gene expression, and global patterns, as well as specific patterns for genes and samples. In our examples, we're using a table that includes names like ENSG, ENST, ENSMUSG, and XLOC. ENSG stands for a human gene in the ensemble format. ENST stands for human transcript in ensemble ID. ANS must G stands for mus musculus or mouse gene. And XLOC stands for an unannotated transcript that was identified through cufflinks and cuff merge. To understand what each individual gene looks like, we can plot the numbers in a bar plot. And so here you have a couple of examples of a gene that has some level of expression in several different samples or across all of the samples that we have in our data. The annotation of genes started immediately with the Human Genome Project. The major goal was to identify all of the genes that are present in the human genome. Now there are approximately 22,500 genes in the human genome, and that number varies between different organisms. They are recorded in a variety of different databases. And according to those databases, they provide you with a unique ID. The issue is that some IDs are more specific than others. For example, genes can have a common name. The problem with the common name is that sometimes the common name can mean something in a different format. For example, a major challenge in Excel is when the gene name, like MAR1, would be transformed into March 1st automatically by Excel without any notification for you as the user. Another issue is that sometimes multiple transcripts could have the same gene symbol. And so you might have repeated rows in your table, which will cause problems when you try to work with such a table in R or Python. So that's why a number of different strategies for naming genes has been proposed. The ensemble ID includes the name of the organism with an identification number. Untres ID only provides you with a number. 
each gene will have multiple transcripts that are typically annotated, and those would be ENST with a number for a human transcript. And you also have annotation of gene function through a description and gene ontology that tries to organize all of this information about genes and what they do in some kind of a logical schema. The best way to find specific biological examples of meaningful processing, annotation, and interpretation of these statistically significant patterns in gene expression data is by look through a number of exemplar projects that we have prepared. And those include working with cancer macrophages, modeling cancer precision medicine, where we look at different types of cell lines, PDX tumor microenvironment, which is a project that you will be introduced to in the transcriptomics course, but also we will find other types of projects like malaria infection, potato drought resistance, or TCGA, liver cancer risk, through the Cancer Genome Atlas. So let's talk about analysis, normalization, and visualization of gene and isoform expression. When you complete your pipeline, you will find several different outputs that are typically going to be in a TXT format. So you will find things like elements of expression, normalized and filtered tables, as well as mapping and quality statistics. Each one of these could be used in a variety of ways to help you understand where do you have important patterns that you can use to interpret and validate your analysis results in terms of quality and biological meaning. One of the next challenges when we complete the pipeline is to open one of these files, let's say in Excel, in R or in Python. So we'll briefly talk about how to do that in all of these three environments. As we already saw, the expression table is a tab delimited TXT file that includes columns that are annotated in the header, which is the first row of that table that provides us with sample names. Typically those sample names will be transformed to remind us of what are the processing steps that were done to that sample for example, here you can see additional words added to the name, like no adapters, no PCR, and PE. So no adapters and no PCR means that they were processed with pre-processing steps, PCR clean, and trimomatic. PE stands for pair and reads. In the gene ID, you will find that there is a name and then dot something and so that dot something actually stands for a transcript so you can forget about what is after the dot because what we're looking at is a, an expression of genes not isoforms and the expression level is typically going to be in fpkm format which stands for fragments per kilobase per million which is a standard way to normalize your data when you have pair and reads what it normalizes for is the length of each gene because statistically speaking, the longer the gene, the more likely we will find reads that fall into that section on the genome. And for the total number of reads per million that we have in a given sample. So this number is not going to be an integer, it's going to be a float. So it's going to have some kind of a point something after that. It's not a whole number. And so what? why do we find this not whole number? The reason is because uh, we are actually using a technique to try and distinguish what is an actual abundance of reads within the section that we call a gene, as opposed to some random noise where reads could, by chance, align to some uh, section of the genome with um, a method called RSEM. So using RSEM typically produces a normalized read count or FPKM and TPM numbers that are essentially not whole numbers, not integers. So let's take a look at how we can perform some of these basic steps in Microsoft Excel to load our data into Microsoft Excel, set up our data frame, use the numeric matrix of our data so that we can summarize it and understand what's in it, and how to plot our data so that we can visually see some of the patterns that appear in this table. When you open this data in Excel, and I'm going to be using here an example from Excel on a Mac. If you want to look up some of these methods in Excel on a PC, 
I recommend looking on YouTube or on Google. There are many, many tutorials on how to do these things. The first way that we would like to look at data is to summarize it using a box plot. Now, a box plot is an advanced, so to say, statistical method of visualizing data because it provides us not with a view of each individual gene or each individual number that we have, which is just too many. We have over 6,000 genes in this case, but it tries to summarize the sample statistics in a way that we can compare overall distribution of our data per sample. So if you go into insert menu and then there find this little button that looks like a histogram, you will open it and you will see that there are two methods, a histogram and a plot called box and whisker. So let's take the box and whisker option and you do this after you select all of your data. And what you will find is a plot that looks something like this. What does this mean? This means that the majority of our rows are found at the very bottom of the Y axis. So the X axis here is samples. The Y axis is level of expression. So the majority of our data falls between zero and maybe 1000. And then the outliers range from about 1000 to something like 16,000. So first of all, how do you manipulate this specific chart? In Excel, you can select different aspects of this chart and open the formatting panel where you will be able to adjust different aspects of your axes. For example, if you select the X axis, you can change how wide or narrow these are. And you can also adjust how individual samples look by assigning them with a fill color and a color for the border of that specific box and whisker. But let's now speak a little bit about box plots. What essentially are box plots showing? So typically a box plot looks something like this. Here you can see this is scale data. So you can see that the middle of your Y scale is zero. And for each one of your samples, you have a separate box. And so these represent different statistical properties of your data. For example, you will find here the max value, the minimum value, the upper and the lower quartile, as well as the median. And sometimes you will also find the mean. So you can include the mean in your box plot. So what does that tell us? That tell us that on average, we can see whether one sample has a significantly higher level of expression overall compared to others. Maybe it has more outliers. Maybe it is more or less normally distributed or skewed. And now we can kind of evaluate the quality of our samples because overall we would expect that conditions essentially have some uh, comparable patterns within and the difference between the conditions would be also evident in some of these major patterns that we can observe here. Now, unfortunately, our data looks like this. And so we can't really see the majority of our values, right? So we see only the outliers. The way to address this is through log scale transformation. So essentially we can transform not the data itself, but just the scale that we are presenting our data in. And that will help us see the bulk of our data all of a sudden much more visible because as you can remember, logarithmic scale brings the very high numbers that we saw there up to 16,000 much, much closer to the lower numbers, which were all under 1,000, right? So we have this 16 time, 16-fold uh, higher numbers in the upper scale than the lower scale. And now we can see much better what's happening overall throughout the data. Now, how would we do this? If we plot just the FPKM numbers, we will get what you see here on the left. If we transform our data to logarithmic scale, you will see that the data becomes much more expanded and easier to see what it looks like. Now, to do that in Excel, all we need to do is copy over all of the columns and insert in each cell LN and in parentheses, the cell that we are using as the original number plus one, Y plus one, the logarithm of one is zero. And so we don't have to worry about adding that, but we cannot perform logarithm of zero. And so that's why we have to have a minimum of one if we have these zero numbers, which you will come across 
in your data. Now, another thing to remember is that each one of these samples, now we're not talking about genes, we're talking about samples, could be viewed as a histogram that shows us the distribution of each sample. So essentially a box plot is very similar because it shows the distribution as well, but it kind of loses the actual distribution pattern, just showing us the maximum, minimum, and the interquartile range, kind of not letting us see it bin by bin as we can see in a histogram. The difference between the histogram and the box plot is that in the histogram, we can ask the question whether our sample is normally distributed. Now, why is normal distribution important for our downstream analysis? Many of the statistical tests that we will use assume some kind of a normal distribution. And even if they don't, they will produce higher statistical power if they do. Now, is it a must to transform your data to normal distribution for you to be able to perform downstream analysis? No, it is not. But for some cases, it is going to be very useful. For example, one of the methods that we will use to investigate general patterns in the data is called principal component analysis. And for principal component analysis, normalized data and scale data is going to be useful for your ability to interpret what the, the analysis actually is showing you. So let's take a look at how logarithmic scale can be useful to transform our data. And that's what you see right here. This is your original data on the left. This is actually data after log scale transformation. Now, another thing to remember when you perform this kind of transformation is a couple of additional methods of normalization that are typically used. What are these methods? One important thing to remember is that we have some level of very low expressed genes. You can see here on the right between 0 and 0 0.23 and all the way up until maybe two or three or four or even five. So it will be very difficult to find statistically significant differences within these low expressed genes. Because we have low expressed genes in different samples that have different distributions, it's useful to find a method that can normalize distribution across our samples so that we can make them more comparable to each other. And so one way to do that is called quantile normalization. Essentially what quantile normalization does is it makes the samples similarly distributed and aligned at the mean. So we can take two samples and assume that they represent the exact same condition. Our overall expectation would be that a gene in one sample from the same condition and another sample from another condition would be very comparable. So we transform the data as opposed to just changing the scale, but we're essentially working with the distribution and the mean aligning them to each other rather than um, working individually with, with each sample. So on the platform, you will also find the quantile normalization option and as you can see, after quantile normalization, the data becomes much more comparable to each other. One of the questions for quantile normalization is a threshold. What is a threshold that we should use when we perform quantile normalization? The answer to that question is really dependent on your data set. So investigating your data and understanding the overall pattern is going to be important for you to choose that threshold correctly. Uh, as a standard option, you can use 1000 for non-log scale or five for scale. And this is of course a rule of thumb, but you should really look into your data to find a threshold that you should uh, use for your specific data set. Uh, in this case, we can look at our data distribution try to make it more normal-like by performing log scaling and filtering of low expressed genes, and then thinking about where is the signal in our data. And the signal in the data is going to be most significant for more highly expressed genes that are going to be having the most effect on the condition, so on the phenotype, and then taking the rest of the data underneath, the, underneath that threshold and assuming that the majority of that data represents some normal biological function 
And because it is normal biological function that is going to be quite similar between all of the samples that we have, we can now normalize that with quantile normalization without touching anything above that threshold. So the threshold means that everything under that threshold is going to be quantile normalized. Everything above will be left exactly the same like we have it. On the platform, you will also find that you have several options. And those options include logarithmic scale. And when you perform this transformation, you will see how it changes the way that you evaluate differences between genes. So here's an example of a gene. In is G123416. And you can see it before and after quantile normalization and log scale transformation. So first of all, when we look at it before any kind of transformation, you can see that the top expression is in the first sample. And that sample is an ER positive sample. An expression is very close to 5,000. None of the genes really come close to that. And our uh, expectation just by looking at this with our eyes is that ER positive samples have a higher overall expression compared to triple negative. But when we think about how high it is and how much higher overall compared to the other types of samples, what we need to remember is that the data is not normalized. So it is likely to be affected by issues like total number of reads in each sample that we have, maybe the quality of mapping, so which proportion of reads was mapped to the reference genome, and all kinds of other technical issues that we have less control over. After quantile normalization with a threshold of five, we can see that the comparison now is much more clear. Overall, there is not such a statistical difference between these two conditions. Now, another way to check this is, again, to follow the same assumption that our individual samples in a group of samples should be comparable to each other. So if they are comparable to each other, that means that we can plot one of them on the x-axis and another one on the y-axis. And if we draw a parallel line, that line represents exact similarity between these samples in terms of levels of gene expression. So if we plot it without normalization and without log scaling, you can see that it's very difficult to see that these samples actually do represent the same condition. After this transformation, you can see that it is much more clear that in, in fact they do have a relationship and they are quite similar to each other. So that's another way to check how your data changed after these transformations. Now let's take a look at how we can perform some of these uh, steps in our in our studio. So we'll talk about again loading data, setting up a data frame, working with the matrices, and plotting the data. And all of these are going to be very useful for you to do uh, independently. We have some practice exercises that you can go through and see how they are done in terms of syntax and in terms of application to different formats. Here we have a process for working with this data in R. So exactly how to do this, you can read about and practice in the tutorial online, but I'll just briefly explain some of the things that you need to remember as you get started in R. Now I'm going to skip all of the standard introductions about setting up R, installing the different packages, all of that is going to be very specific to your environment, how it's set up, what kind of operating system you have, uh, different versions and, and where you download things from. And we try to cover that in the introductory course in R. So I welcome you to go and uh, see all of those explanations there. But here I'll just briefly focus on the concepts and the syntax that you need to keep in mind as you go through these exercises. R is an object-oriented language. Anything like a variable, a plot, or a table of data is stored as an object. That object has properties, and once it is loaded in the proper format, we can do actions or functions on that object. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to load our data and put it into an object. To do that, we use the equal sign, or as people use in R, 
sign that you see right here, which is uh, the less sign and the dash. Okay, so these are equivalent to each other. To load the table, you have to understand what the table format is. The format could be a TXT, and if it is a TXT, it has a separator in between your columns. So that separator could be a tab, could be a comma, could be a dot, underscore, space, right? It could be a number of different things. So that's why when you use the function read table, you have to also specify how is it going to be separated. And where is it loaded from is also an important thing to remember. So you can either provide a link, like an HTTP link where the table is stored, or you can upload the data on your computer, and then you have to provide it with a path. In our studio on your computer, you would typically set a working directory so that you don't have to write the full path to, your, uh, to the names of your files. You can just put the name of the file. If it is within the main working directory, that would be sufficient for you to be loading the data from there. If your data is in a comma-separated value format, CSV format, you can use read.csv. If it is in Excel, you can say uh, there is a package to read uh, Excel files, and so you can load that package and then read the data from an Excel, specifying which sheet in your Excel file you would like to use. The data could be stored as a data frame, matrix, a list, or an array. A data frame is essentially a table like an Excel table, where you have your strings as row names and column names, and the rest of the data could be numeric, integers or floats. A matrix is just the numeric portion of that data. So you could store the names of your columns and the names of your genes, let's say, as a list. You can then store your full data frame your full table as a data frame. You can separate the portion of the data frame and turn it into a matrix. And having it in a matrix allows you to perform summary statistics and visualize the data for numeric type of statistical representations like histograms and box plots. Lists and arrays are going to be useful because oftentimes you need to remember different things and use them later on down the road. When you load your data, let's say you call your data frame DF, or you can call it gene expression or any name that you would like. Once it is an object, you can also transform it into a matrix by simply saying as dot matrix and in parentheses, the name of your data frame. Once you have that data frame, you can calculate the mean or produce a summary for your whole data frame and understand differences between different elements by doing by looking at the summary instead of the actual data that you have. How to visualize the data. Inside the same tutorial, you will find detailed explanations on how to plot, plot box plots that we just discussed today, bar plots, which are going to be useful for visualizing genes across samples, for example, Scatter plots, where you can compare a couple of samples and how they relate to each other. Or heat maps, where heat maps are most useful for visualizing a small portion of genes, maybe 20 or 50 or 100, to view how they relate to each other based on gene expression patterns. And so all of these are going to be provided in the exercises for base, which is the basic functionality of R, but also in ggplot, a popular visualization package for R. Now, all of these same things could be done in Python. The difference between Python and R uh, primarily is that Python does take a little bit longer to install and set up. Uh, you do have some key libraries that we will talk about here where you would have to find different types of functionality. The syntax is a little bit different, but after a little bit of practice in both languages, it will be fairly simple for you to start working with your data in either one. Deciding on each one 
I think is really beneficial for those of you that will be um, working uh, with standard statistical methods and quick outputs that are publication ready. That's typically going to be easier in R. Um, Python is going to be a little bit more efficient, probably. Uh, more um, appropriate for those of you that are going to be working with big data, machine learning, and things like that, even though both are possible in either language. In Python, there are two major libraries to work with data, NumPy and Pandas. NumPy is essentially a series of functions that are designed to work with matrices, with numbers. And Pandas is more specific to working with data frames, of course, Pandas leverages the NumPy library to perform many of the analytical uh, steps that we will talk about today. Now, on the portal, again, you have a way to practice some of the syntax. It's important to get started, to import the libraries. In Python, libraries are loaded as objects, and then from those objects, you can do a path to a specific function. Uh, but it also provides you with some steps and work with some of those uh, data frame aspects like finding specific columns, rows. Uh, but essentially, as you go through the tutorial, you will see that it is very similar to R, even though some of the syntax is going to be different. So I'm going to use a Google Colab notebook. As you can see, I already wrote here importing packages and I'm importing pandas and spd and numpy as np. My data is going to be stored on GitHub. So I'm going to take a link and I'm going to load this data. So I'm going to call this variable gene expression equals. And now I need to say pd because it's a function of pandas. And I'm going to say read table. Now in parentheses, going to paste the link to the data. To preview the data, I can load only the head, only the first several rows of this data. Now I can see that I have my genes and the header row is right here with all of my numbers inside of these cells. I can also set the index to be the ID so that this is not included in the numeric part of my data. To do that, I have to say gene expression index. Equals to gene expression and the column name is ID. So here I have ID. Now if I preview it again, we will see that now the name of each gene is stored in a separate special column called ID. Since now I have another column inside the data, I need to remove it from my actual data set. I can do that using a command called drop. So here I need to say that it equals to the same, but I'm going to drop a column called ID. So to do that, I need to specify here ID and mention that the axis equals one, which would mean the column. And again, I can say gene expression head. So now my data is ready for analysis. Gene expression. And now I can specify the location, specifically naming, let's take the first gene that we have. And after that, I just need to say plot.bar. And here we have the bar plot for this particular gene. We can also specify in here to give it a title.
and now we know that this is the plot for this specific gene across our samples. To make a box plot is also easy. Gene expression. And here we have our box plot. As you can see, the titles of each sample are not rotated correctly. So I can just add in here, rot equals 90. And this is our raw data for the gene expression box plot across samples. Data to logarithmic scale, all we have to do is say gene expression log equals numpy dot log. And now we use gene expression plus one. To visualize as a box plot, we simply take gene expression log box plot rot equals 90. And now we can see what this data looks like in logarithmic scale. So what are some of the conclusions from today's session? You saw today how to take the table of expression and start working with it in Excel, R, and Python. You should be able to understand the difference between data frames, matrices, lists, and arrays. You should be able to know how to summarize and visualize your data using box plots, histograms, bar plots, uh, and even heat maps after a little bit of practice. And you can start testing some of the assumptions that you might have about your data. For example, how comparable are different samples? How are they different overall? And how maybe some specific patterns could be found in the data. You will also see some of the steps to scale and transform data. And I do want to remind you that the bulk of these methods are described in very specific details in the online tutorial. So really, I encourage you to go through those tutorials and do some practice as well. That's it for today. In our next session, we will talk about principal component analysis.